Shadow of the Beast is an iconic game that really showed just what the Amiga home computer could do in terms of graphics with its 12 layers of parallax scrolling and amazing sound. It is a game loved by many, but let's not kid ourselves. As a game, especially to people who grew up on console games, this is a shiny turd of a game, cult classic or not. Shadow of the Beast first appeared on the Amiga back in 1989. Many people think that Psygnosis developed the game, but it was actually developed by Reflections and published by Psygnosis. Martin Edmondson, one of the designers of Shadow of the Beast, loved difficult games, so he purposely designed this game to be as difficult as possible. A difficult game is fine if designed well. Unfortunately, this game isn't designed well from a gameplay perspective. The controls, while making use of two buttons, are unresponsive. It's practically impossible to turn around in time to attack enemies coming from behind. It has the typical European computer game enemy placement, you know, the type when enemies suddenly appear right in front of you, or stuff falling from the ceiling or coming out of the ground without any warning. I hate that. It's just bad game design that makes this game hard, not clever design. Oh, and yes, I'm cheating because playing Shadow of the Beast multiple times over different platforms is asking way too much even of a saint. Upon starting the Atari ST port, we are granted with the same music as the Amiga version. It's sampled of course, but it's still cool to hear it here. Then we get the opening still. The port is looking great, but then the game starts. Instantly we can see that the game has lost its flair. Far less parallax scrolling, horrible colours and no in-game music at all. The two button controls have also gone and now feel even stiffer than the Amiga original. Sadly the Atari ST version isn't very good and it should have been much better than this. I have to say that I'm actually quite surprised with Gremlin graphics port to the Amstrad CPC. Yes, it's got sluggish attacks, but the game works so well on the CPC. It's relatively smooth for the system, has parallax scrolling, in-game music, and far less loading than the Amiga or ST versions. CPC fans should check this game out. It may not be perfect, but it's well worth a try.
ZX Spectrum owners get a port that's pretty much the same as the Amstrad CPC version, minus the colors and still images between areas. Gameplay and level of detail are basically the same. Unlike the Amstrad and ZX Spectrum ports, the Commodore 64 version may have been developed by Cygnosis, although I can't be sure. It sure looks a lot closer to the Amiga original, featuring most of the enemies as well as a few original enemies. There's even a mighty impressive showing of 8 layers of parallax scrolling. Even the music is pretty good, although you have to choose between music or sound effects. Unfortunately the game is still a stiff and unfair experience despite it being rather impressive for the C64. WJS Design was behind the Mega Drive port, and what an unfortunate port it is. The game was not optimized for the North American NTSC machines, so it runs too fast, making it almost impossible to complete. This was corrected in the Japanese release, however. Other issues with this Western version are the poor collision detection, awful jump kick timing, missing art assets, muddy colors, and hot audio. By that, I mean the audio is overpowered, causing it to clip and sound distorted. The Japanese Mega Drive version was released by Victor Japan, otherwise known as JVC. Victor Japan had requested many changes to be made to the game by WJS Design, resulting in a much better experience. Changes include adjustments to the graphics, better collision detection, fixed jump kick attack timing, added background art assets, new audio, and options which include the sound test and the ability to add or decrease lives and a proper end sequence. It also includes a much needed additional healing item in a later stage. So as you can see, this is a much better version than the crap Electronic Arts were happy to release in the West. Thank you. 
I'm not sure if IGS are the actual developers of this port, as they were mostly a publisher. Wikipedia states that this port was developed by Signosis. This SNES version was never actually released and may even be incomplete. The game is much faster than the Amiga original and features some very strange additions, such as the Beast now being able to pick up a laser gun at the very beginning of the game. The music has also been given a much more upbeat tempo and the graphics are more colourful appearance. Stages are also redesigned and missing all the cinematic cutscenes. As it stands, this is a pretty awful port. Far too difficult with bad collision detection. But then again, this is probably not a completed game. Magic were the developers of the Master System port. I have to commend them on actually attempting to bring this game to the Master System. There are many cutbacks, but to make up for this, Tech Magic have added lives to the game, which are a welcome addition to the standard one life, then game over. They've also added nice little details, such as the beast's chest moving as he breathes. The core gameplay is also altered. Now we have an item screen which you must enter in order to use items you pick up. You'll also need to enter here when wanting to use keys to enter doors. As for the game, well, it's not a bad playable port. However, saying that, I do wish Tech Magic had not used one of the Master System's buttons to bring up the item select menu. Having to push up to jump in a platform game is annoying. The Atari Lynx version was developed by Digital Developments, and what's strange about this port is that it seems to be based upon the unreleased SNES version, plus adds its own little changes to the mix. As ports of Shadow of the Beast go, this is a fairly reasonable effort. The game suffers from poor stage design that all other versions suffer from, as well as the odd collision detection, but it does add some nice scaling effects. Manjura is missing the cinematic scenes. For the time, the only real way to play Shadow of the Beast on the move. It's not a bad addition to the Lynx's library of games.
before we start, I must point out that this is being emulated due to my FM Town CD drive having issues. Sadly, emulation doesn't work well for this game, so please do excuse the half-rendered background. Many people regard the FM Towns port to be the ultimate version of Shadow of the Beast, and it's easy to see why. The game features the best graphics out of any home port, with loads of animation plus a really good arranged soundtrack. Unfortunately, it's still a really bad game. Loads of cheap enemy placements, unavoidable hits, and blind jumps. Now while many think that the FM Towns port is the ultimate version, I have to disagree. Yes the FM Towns port looks the best, but the only version of Shadow of the Beast to be any fun to play is on the PC Engine. EMA Design, who are still around and currently known as Rockstar Games, were responsible for this port and what a great job they've done. The response time to attacks is now spot on. Many of the stupidly placed enemies have been changed drastically reducing the cheap deaths. Collision detection is also pixel perfect now and the soundtrack is great. Because of all these gameplay enhancements, the PC Engine port is by far the best version of Shadow of the Beast in existence. Well, in my opinion it is. Here's a nice surprise for you, did you know that Shadow of the Beast was also in development for Atari's 8-bit line of home computers? Yes, it's true. As you can see the game was never completed, but from what was made it looks like it may have been a pretty good port. Let's take a look at all those versions of Shadow of the Beast running side by side. 